as they left Egypt, we read in the book of Exodus, chapter 13, at the end of the chapter, that uh, the Lord, in verse 21, went before them by day in a cloud of pillar to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from them from before the people. God was with the children of Israel as they left Egypt. And his angel, or the angel of the Lord, uh, in a cloud went with them. And this was quite miraculous because this cloud was giving them light during the night and leading them during the day. <clears throat> and then when the Egyptians came behind them, this pillar of cloud moved from, it was in front of them, leading them, it moved from in front of them and came in between the Egyptians who were out, coming out behind them and the children of Israel. So it's quite amazing. <coughs> they could have taken 11 days to go from Ramesses <coughs> to the land of Canaan that God had promised, a direct route. But instead, God took them into the wilderness, into the desert, where they spent 40 years, almost going <coughs> round and round. There's a reason for that, and we'll come to that later. <coughs> However, when they went uh, in this journey, they found themselves facing the sea, the Red Sea. And when they came towards the Red Sea, northern the Mediterranean, it is quiet for a while, and then it can change very quickly, and suddenly, and the waves can come lashing. And, and the sea can become very rough and scary and frightening. Maybe it was like that on that day. So the sea in front of them and on either side of them were mountains. And then behind them were the Egyptians. So they were really now having come out of Egypt, being set free from slavery. Now they were in big trouble because there was nowhere to go. They couldn't go back because the Egyptians were coming behind them. Pharaoh and all his chariots and the army were behind them. In front of them was the sea. And on either side of them were the mountains. There was nowhere to go. It was impossible. But <clears throat> God was with them. God was with them. And what Moses said to them in verse 13 of the book of Exodus is really our text today. And they said to Moses, look, why did you bring us here? You know, were, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you have brought us here? This is what we were telling you, leave us in Egypt. We want to serve the Egyptians. But Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. And that was very powerful, what Moses said. And the Lord will fight for you, you only have to be silent. Now, Moses was crying out to God for deliverance. But God said to Moses, it's not time to pray. Now, you know, there is time to pray. And prayer is very important. Actually, you know, I would say that we don't pray enough. You and I, we don't pray enough. <coughs> we should be pray spending more time. But then there is a time for action. We pray, we wait upon God, we believe, and then we have to obey God, 
do his will. That's what God said to Moses. Why are you crying to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. You know, there's nowhere to go. There's a sea in front of them and mountains and the Egyptians are behind. And God is saying, go forward and until you stand in the water. So Moses actually stood in the water with the rod. And as he stretched out, God started moving. And he sent a very powerful east wind which began to part the sea, part the sea. There are seats everywhere, especially in the front. <laughs> it's not a scary place to sit down. And um, God, you know, with the east wind, he parted the sea so that the water stood upstream and downstream. And so the children of Israel were able to cross the Red Sea on dry ground. It was an amazing experience. Something that happened and the Bible records for us as history. It's not something that has been made up. It's actually happened. That they were delivered like that. That God opened the Red Sea for them. And they walked on dry ground. And when the Egyptians tried to follow them, because they saw what was happening, the waters receded and they were covered and they were drowned and all the chariots of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his soldiers, his army, his people, they all drowned. Thus God saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. What a great story it is. Now, <coughs> the Bible tells us that we should remember these things. That we should read about them and hear about them again and again because we are liable to forget God. We are liable to forget what He is really like and what He has done. In the previous chapter, when God gave Moses instructions and Moses had to, you know tell them and, and institute what was the feast of the unleavened bread which was associated with the Passover, the deliverance from Egypt. So every year they were to celebrate the Passover followed by a feast of unleavened bread. So for seven days they were to remove leaven from their homes and completely and they were to fast, they were to pray, they were to then celebrate, have a big feast towards the end of it. And God said to Moses in chapter 13, you know, remember, when Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt. And, you know, as far as we are concerned, what Jesus has done for us is a deliverance from Egypt. Egypt is the world. It's like the world. Egypt and the tyranny of Pharaoh represents what sin is like. The slavery of sin. The dominion of darkness and fear. There's a lot of fear today. Are you afraid? Are you afraid of the coronavirus? There's a lot of fear. And if it took a hold of any one of us, are you ready? Well, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen and how we're going to take it. Some people take it mildly, some people don't take it mildly. Some people have very severe sy symptoms. They end up in hospital on respirators and machines breathing for them with acute pneumonia. Some people die from it. People have died from it. And God delivered them. Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt out of the house of slavery for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. That's what it was. You know, and, and this, you, know, you have to study the cross. You have to uh, stand there. You have to meditate upon the cross of Jesus, the death of Jesus. You know, uh, when you think about it, a man hanging on a cross, on a crucifix, nailed to it, 
were bleeding with his uh, crown of thorns on his head and looking very black and blue with all the bruises uh, and, and you know just looking helpless you know Jesus on the cross he looks completely helpless and powerless a victim but it is the most powerful thing that God has done there is nothing more powerful than the death of Jesus because there, there is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes for with a strong hand and again in the same chapter in verse 8 uh, Moses says you know when, when, when you celebrate the feast of the unleavened bread you shall tell your son in verse 8 on that day so we are to not only remember these things we have to learn about these things then we have to tell other people our families our children you and I are under command from God to teach our children the Bible the commandments of God the word of God about Jesus you are commanded by God to do that God will hold you responsible one day when you die, Jesus will ask you, what did you teach your children? And if you don't teach them, then you are going to be disciplined. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It shall be for you a sign on your hand as a memorial between your eyes that the law of God may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. And you shall ever keep this statue uh, and its appointment from appointed time from year to year. Then again, you know, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means second law. This is Moses reciting everything that God had done for his people. And we're in chapter 6, you know, we read again uh, in verse 20. And all the statutes, God's law, God's word, when he gave them. And when your son asks you, Moses says, uh, you know, in time to come, what is the meaning of these testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were fellow slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt. With a mighty hand, the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt, against Pharaoh, and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, and that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to our fathers, and so on. Remember. The second thing we will notice, how important it is to learn from history especially the history of the church now <clears throat> there was a time many many years ago I used to find history very boring really uninteresting but since the day I came to Jesus history has become very important and I read about things and I, and I read as I had to read in preparing for the ministry the history of the church to remember what God has done and to learn from history you see the doctrines that we believe they are historic doctrines the church studied the Bible and came to understand that this is what God was teaching the church did not make it up we have not made up the Trinity, by the way. It's not something that, you know, bishops met one day in the 4th century and then they decided we must believe in the Trinity. No, that is not what happened. What happened is that they studied the Bible and they met together and they discussed what the Bible was teaching and then they agreed, yes, this is what the Bible teaches and we must believe. So that we will not make the mistakes, you know, that people have made and, and be encouraged by the, the victories. We must remember what 
you know, the great things that God has done over the last 2,000 years. Not just today, but you know, <clears throat> you must remember, you know, there were times of revivals. There were revivals in the Bible. The times of Hezekiah, the time of Ezra, the time of Josiah. You know, in the days of Josiah, king of Judah, things were really bleak. You know, people had forgotten uh, Egypt and forgotten all the things that God had done. And then, amazingly, they found a scroll. And a scroll was found, and it was read before the king, and he tore his robes. And he confessed his sins to God and the sins of his people to God. And then there followed a revival. And revival, you see, revival is you revive something, a fire, you, you revive it. You, you know, uh, take the coals, you stir them up so that the fire starts blowing again and burning again brightly. And we need that. We need that in Cyprus. We need it here. I need it. I need to be revived and we need to be revived. So that the fire of God's love will be rekindled again. That we will start living like what God really wants us to live like. At the cut, cutting edge of Christianity. So that when you walk in a room, people are silent. And they become aware of God. That you are taking God's presence with you wherever you go. If you are not living like that, my dear friend, you are a poor Christian. I am sorry. We need to be what, what God wants us to be. Jesus said, you know, he cried out on the great day of the feast, If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. So at the moment, you know, we are just, you know, trickling one drop at a time. But the Bible says, there are rivers of life that should be outflowing from within us. You know, there was a young man in, in oh, 400 years ago. It's an amazing story. Uh, I may have said it uh, before. In 1630, so that's 400 years ago. Almost. In Kirk of Shorts, that's in the um, Scotland somewhere, and the Kirk was, you know, this church and the people, they were meeting at a communion service. So because there were so many people, they, they couldn't meet in the church, so they had to meet outside. And the climate at, at that time, as it sometimes is in Scotland, damp and so on, and looked as if it was going to rain at any time. And there were so many people there. People, mothers standing there with small babies, so little children, young children, young people, everybody was there. Some people were sitting, some people were standing, and this young preacher, uh, he was only young, in his early 20s, John Livingston, he was preaching. And he preached for one, hour, one and a half hours, one and a half hours, to a massive crowd of people. Maybe a thousand, maybe a, one and a half thousand, maybe more. And he just thought it was so hard. He didn't think anybody was listening at all to the word of God. And then you know, all of a sudden it started raining. And when it started raining, you know, people were wearing this Macintosh. Macintosh is like a, an overcoat or like a raincoat. And they took up their Macintoshes and they started covering themselves, protect them from the rain. And then he said, Where would you go? Where would you run? If even one little drop of God's anger against sin. Your sin should fall upon you. Where would you go? Where would you hide? And then, the Holy Spirit fell down upon that place. And he preached for another hour and a half. So his sermon was three hours long. <laughs> I'm not going to do that today. You have to miss lunch. And the next hour and a half, people were crying, people were broken. You know, 500 people, 
500 people were saved that day. And there were people there, even though they were not saved, even though they were not really changed, transformed, but they remembered being there for the rest of their lives. They never forgot Kirk of Shot. And we have to read about things like that. We have to read about this parting of the Red Sea. What God did for them. And they crossed uh, almost uh, more than a million people. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Something that is impossible. People still don't believe it. They can, it cannot happen. So many people to cross the land. They did it. It happened. And they were to remember it again and again. Look at the psalmist, you know, in Psalm, uh, the Psalms tell us about it again and again. Psalm 44 is one of them, the Psalms of Korah. So at a time, uh, maybe during the time of the captivity, you know, when things were really bleak. Psalm 44 is page 470, and he says, O oh God, our, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us, what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. We have heard from our fathers what you have done in the past. With your own hand, drove out the nations, but then you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but then you set free. Not by their own sword did they win their land, and not did their own arm save them, but your right hand your arm, the light of your face, for you delighted in them. And in a day when that was a day of small things, a day of bleak things, when the gospel was small, he prays earnestly at the end of that psalm, awake. You know, to, to speak to God like this, you really have to be living very close to him in the first place. To say to God, wake up. I think you are sleeping. I think you have gone away. <coughs> Jeremiah prays like that. Lord, he says, you are a stranger in the land. You are a stranger in the land. And he was. Because the Babylonians had surrounded Jerusalem and Jerusalem was about to be given over to the enemies of Israel. Awake, Lord. Why are you sleeping, O oh Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Remember. And then go forward. God said to Moses, See, Moses was, uh, his, his Moses was an amazing man. Because every time there was a problem, and he had lots and lots of problems. He had huge big problems. Now the people, they had come out of Egypt. Now they were saying to Moses, Moses, it's your fault. It's all your fault, Moses. We blame you. You brought us here. Did you, you know, were there not enough graves in Egypt? No, we could have died in Egypt and buried in Egypt. But now we're in the desert and we're nowhere. There is a sea and there are the mountains and the Egyptians are behind us. Moses, it's your fault. What did Moses do? He turned to God. He turned to God and God says, Why are you praying just now? It isn't the time to pray. It is the time to go forward. Because what had happened was that God, the angel of the Lord, so that's, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a theophany, it's the second person of the Trinity. Jesus before the incarnation he is with them he is with them in this pillar of cloud and so the pillar of cloud moved from front of them and came in the middle well not in the middle at the end at the back of them so that the pillar of cloud was now between their problem and they had a problem they had a very big problem The Egyptians were marching and they were coming and they were going to die. The Israelites were going to die. All of them were going to die because there were nowhere else to go. 
and God moves and this pillar of fire, which is quite amazing, it, for them, you see, facing Israel, it lit up. There was light. Yes. There was light and the pillar of cloud, cloud was giving them light all night. They were, could see everything. And then for the Egyptians, the pillar of cloud was darkness. And in the third watch of the night, God looked cloud and he saw the Egyptians. And God then, you know, it's amazing, you read here in chapter 14, and uh, <clears throat> in verse 24, chapter 14, in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces, forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariots. See, God's uh, we were singing that song, it wasn't really by accident, about the providence of God. The providence of God is the good government of God in the universe. That God is running everything. God is in charge. God is in charge, totally in charge of this coronavirus, by the way. Because if you don't believe that, you're going to live in fear day and night. And you'll have to run then and there's nowhere to go. But if you believe in the providence of God, you are in the best place where God wants you to be. And if you are in the will of God, if you are in the will of God, if you are here because it is God's will, my dear friend, and I've heard it and other pastors have told me again and again, if you are in the will of God, no matter where you are, you are in Cyprus or anywhere you are, you are in the safest place to be. And they were in the safest place to be. They didn't realize that, but the children of Israel that night were in the safest place. Because the pillar of cloud now came between their big problem and you might have a problem. You might have a problem that is you know, like this Red Sea in front of you and mountains on either side of you and all the Egyptian forces are behind you. And God knew because they were his people. They were his people. God cared for them. God loved them. God had promised them that he was going to give them the land. So he was going to do it. God was never going to change his mind about the things that he had promised. So he moved between them and the Egyptians. And that's what God will do. And God said to Moses, Why? Why are you crying to me? Why are you crying to me? Verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. The writer to the Hebrews, he tells us that by faith, by faith, by faith the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea. So they had to believe because Moses had to stand in the water. He had to stand in the water. And he had to stretch out his hands as God had told him to. And the Bible says Moses believed. And then the people also believed that God was going to do something. None of them knew what God was going to do. And God did something. By faith the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians when they attempted to do so the same were drowned. Why do you cry to me? Go forth. You sometimes... You know, that's what we have to do with our problems. Sometimes our problems can be huge. Impossible to move. And your faith might be wavering, looking at all the terrible situations that you face, and that you might be facing. God only knows the troubles of your heart. Amen. And you might have many of them. But God is saying, face them. No need to run away from them, but face them. 
But don't face them alone. Face them by faith. You have to trust God. You have to believe God. You have to believe God's word. Even when your eyes tell you don't do it. Your ears tell you don't do it. Your body tells you don't do it. God says believe. Go forward. Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Psalm 66. You know, me, some of these psalms were written, they were written by God's people when they had amazing trou troubles. It's another psalm, and it recounts history. That's why I, I mentioned history, how important it is. The Reformation, what happened at the Reformation? How God took a, a monk, an unknown monk, Martin Luther, in Germany, sitting in his room. And he had nowhere to go because he had already tried to get help from one, one father and another father and another father. And none of them could help him. And then somebody told him, go and read your Bible. I says, nobody told me to do that. I'm going to do that. So he goes into his room, shuts the door, lights a candle. And he picks up a, a new translation that had just come out. Erasmus Bible, it was called a Greek translation. That had been just been put together and started reading from Romans chapter 1. And Paul saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. For in it shall the righteousness of God be revealed. And you know, that man was converted just like that. All alone in this room, reading the Bible, and the Holy Spirit gave him a new birth, and he was saved. His eyes were open, and he believed that Jesus was his righteousness. He didn't need to do any good works. His prayers were not going to save, save him. His communion was not going to save him. His baptism was not going to save him. Jesus was going to save him. And when he believed that, that Jesus had died for him and Jesus had lived a perfect life for him. And he believed and he was justified. He was saved just like that. And it started a revolution. We call it the Reformation. So that he started then preaching the gospel and people started hearing in Germany. And then a German Bible was translated and then in France and the gospel came to France and the gospel went to other parts of Europe and then it came to Scotland and then it came to England and it went to Wales and an English Bible was translated and a man called William uh, Tyndale and he translated the Bible into English you know, it's amazing. He had these manuscripts of the English Bible in him and he was running away because were, he was hunted. There were people in England and the king wanted to kill him because here is a man who had translated the Bible into English. So he was on his boat and the boat capsized or something happened terrible and he lost everything. All the hard work that he had done for over months and months and months. So he went back in hiding again and he started from scratch again and translated the English Bible. You know, you have a Bible in English. Thanks to that man, Tender, who translated it into English. How can we forget these things? We can't forget. They are meant to stir us up. Stir us up. Come and see, says the psalmist in verse 5. Come and see what God has done. You have to come. You have to come to a very, very special place. You have to go there by faith. You can't really, although you can go in Jerusalem, uh, just outside the city, maybe it's the same place, maybe it's not. We cannot be 100% sure. We can be 70% sure, maybe. But we have to by faith go to a graveyard where Jesus was buried. That's where we have to go. And they my dear friend, we have to look and see that the stone has been rolled away 
and that is not there that Jesus is alive. See, the resurrection is the most powerful thing in the world. The resurrection of Jesus. A dead Jesus cannot save you, cannot save you, cannot save you. Oh yes, his blood, his precious blood was shed on the cross, but a dead Jesus cannot do anything. But when he rose again on the third day, victorious he rose again. It was like the Red Sea. That God had parted the Red Sea. And you and I, we can cross the Red Sea on dry ground. Because that's what the resurrection does for us. That Jesus can come to us. He can hear my cry. He can hear that little whimper of me crying out to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus can hear that. And the Holy Spirit can apply the blood of Jesus to you and to me. Save us. And you know the resurrection is historic. It's historic. It's not something that we, you know, like children's stories, you know, like Red Riding Hood, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It's not like one of those stories, it's not a legend even. It is historic, it is rooted in history. Because God had said, this is what I am going to do. My servant will come, my servant will suffer, but then my servant will be triumphant after he suffers, after he is cut down, he will become triumphant. He shall see his seed. See, that's a prophecy about the resurrection. A thousand years before it happened, King David wrote that psalm. Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, See, one person is speaking to another person. One person who is God. Speaking to another person who is also God. How can that be? Only if the Father is speaking to Jesus. And Lord said to my Lord, Sit down at my right hand. Hallelujah. It's a prophecy about the resurrection. But on the third day, it was inevitable that Jesus was going to come out. That death would have to set him free. Death would have to leave him, release him. Why? Because death came for sin. We die because we are sinners. Mankind dies because we have sinned. We have sinned before God. Wherefore, Paul says, as by one man, sin entered into the world. And death by sin. Because we have all sinned. We are dying because we are sinners. And then when Jesus dies for sin, what happens? Death is finished. Death is finished. The preacher 300 years ago, John Owen, and he wrote a book, preached sermons on it. And it's called The Death of Death. It's wonderful. The Death of Death in the Death of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Death dies. In the death of Jesus. And when he rose again. Victorious. You have to believe this. You have to believe. And when you believe it. When you believe that Jesus died. It is miracles. It's all miraculous. It's all supernatural. To believe that a man dying on the cross. Was dying for your sins. Was dying for your sins. And your good works cannot save you. And you have to believe. And you believe that he rose again as the Bible says. And as the evidence shows that Jesus is alive. When you believe my dear friend. God will save you. God will forgive you. God will give you eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Maybe you haven't. Maybe there are people here. Who are not really sure about where you are. But now is the time. Now is that moment. To turn to God and say. Lord. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray. I can't even pray. But I can say this. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, please save me. And I assure you, my dear friend, that he will hear you. 
Because Jesus came for sinners. He died for sinners. He rose again to justify them. And is coming again. Never forget that. May God bless you. We're going to sing the song um, In Christ Alone My Hope is Found. He is my light, my strength, my cornerstone, my all in all. 647, and that is in Christ alone. <coughs> going to sing now. <laughs> I'm sorry I did forget uh, about the choir. Choir singing because they sang the three. But Jason, did you can have you can sing now. Sure indeed, yes, yes, please go. Yeah.